Okay, uh, <clears throat> happy birthday, Franco Albini, uh, 1905, 1977, an important uh, architect and designer uh, from Italy. So Franco Albini, you see, was born on the 17th of October, 1905, was an Italian neo-rationalist architect, designer, and university instructor in design. A native of Robiate near Milan, Albini obtained his degree in architecture at Politecnico di Milano University in 1929 and began his professional career working for Gio Ponti. He started displaying his works at Milan Triennale. In 1930, he opened his own practice. Uh, this is the man, this was the man. Um, both a designer and, uh, and an architect and very accomplished in, uh, in both, maybe particularly in design, but also as an architect, he was very interesting. So Franco Albini, some drawings by him, um, uh, mainly architectural projects, but also um, some, some projects for furniture designs. He, he, he built some uh, important pieces of furniture uh, because he was a, a, an excellent um, industrial designer or, or uh, you know, furniture designer and so on. Franco Albini. This is a drawing for a shelving system that he built and is quite elegant. You don't usually think of a, of a, of a shelving system to be elegant, but, but this one is and very creative. This looks interesting. I, I, I don't think it was built, but uh, I hope I'm wrong. I like the plan. This was a project for a museum which was not built. With uh, Giliotti, another interesting architect. Anyway. So this building was built and you are going to see it. A sketch for a, <clears throat> for a chair. Okay, and now uh, we'll, we'll see the first building by, uh, by him, the Villa Pestarini from 1938. Uh, so before the Second World War. And, uh, you know, I, I read that his pieces of furniture use inexpensive and even raw materials. This, this building also has uh, in my opinion, it's an interesting building. You know, it, it, it's uh, it's it's not a pretentious building. Is and it, its materials seem to be also kind of uh, you know. Now it's also true that uh, it, it, you know there are graffitis and uh, it's, it doesn't seem to be very well taken care of. But uh, I think it's an interesting building. 
um, and especially when you think of these, um, you know, narrow, uh, you know, windows, uh, small windows in this, you know, a large space. Um, The truth is, you know, architecture is beautiful when you when you when when you can manifest what you believe in uh, with sincerity, and even if it is an unconventional uh, conclusion you arrive at, uh, is uh, is um, is uh, enlightening. Is is, but we know it's it's hard to to build exactly what you feel and think, but uh, you know. Uh, I, I don't know if this was maybe it's an apartment just at the top, uh, and maybe you know here is a rather public function of the building, although it is called villa, no. So it's unusual. It's very unusual to have a building of this size, and uh, two thirds of it to to have towards the street uh, such you know, small windows. This is not a, a basement here or here. And yet the windows are identical with those, you know, in the basement. I think it's rather interesting. Now, Albergo Pirovano, Cervinia, 1948, uh, sorry, it should have been 1962. Uh, very interesting, these columns, you know. Uh, <laughs> really, they are, I mean, very unusual. Otherwise, the building is almost so-called traditional, especially seen from here. Uh, an Alpine, uh, you know, building, but uh, the, those uh, columns here create uh, something uh, rather unique. You would not have expected, as I didn't expect, such a building after we saw the, the first one. You would say it's it's rather peculiar, and it is to you know to an extent peculiar, but I think it's interesting mainly because of these um, stone columns. Now the pavilion of Ina. Here is something else altogether. I don't have the, the year when this was built, but um, this is indeed neo-rationalist architecture. Uh, and uh, But it has a, a, a almost a rhetorical uh, modernity. Well, we all know that Italian design is superlative, and uh, you know, it, it, even in modest circumstances, Italians assert a very fine taste for um, exhibition design and, in general, for for uh, interior design and uh, you know, in, especially the school of Milan. Is uh, is very um, uh, you know knowledgeable about uh, exhibition design and so on because they have so many exhibitions in Milan, and it's also a powerful uh, fashion center, and so it's a climate for uh, you know uh, exquisite design in, in these fields. 
quartiere in a casa accesate. This is a more you know, modest, uh, probably with uh, inexpensive uh, uh, row of houses. You can tell that uh, Franco Albini didn't say no to tradition, but he also has you know, insertions of modernity. like this, which is quite elegant and exquisite. And here you can see him as a designer. Now, this is a famous building by him in Rome, La Rinascente. Um, I used an image of detail of this building also in the, in the invitation I sent out. This is a, a department store, you know, a kind of a mall, but it's very elegant. It doesn't, uh, you know, alarm uh, the other buildings on the block, but it's there resolutely modern and, and yet it has some kind of a relationship with, uh, with other buildings in its vicinity. I do think it's, a, it's an excellent building by Franco Albini. It has a sloping roof, but you know, you don't see it because of its height. Um, I, I, I thought, you know, when I first saw the, the images with the building, I thought it had a flat roof. It doesn't. You know, it's uh, this is a uh, you know uh, an image of the model, uh, but but it was built with a with a sloping roof. So this is in Rome, not in Milan. And here you see the drawings of, uh, of the building.
usually it is said that on a big building, you know, with several floors and a big volume, it's not easy to place a sloping roof. Well, this is sloping only to an extent. I mean, it is, but it's also not very, you know, very tall. But it works, you know. You, I mean, you see it here on the side elevation, and it's not, uh, you know, the 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 feeling you get is not at all of a so-called traditional building. Now we see some some works he did in Parma. Franco Albini and the reconstruction of the city of Parma method and the rule. Here we see a building similar to uh, to the building built in Rome. I don't know though if it was built. It was. It has, uh, you know, he's called a neo, neo rationalist, but um, I mean, yes, I do see the rationalist side, but. I, it's, it's more than that because the subtleties of the design, I mean, look, even the, the supporting columns here, they, they have a, I mean, you know, here was a sensitive designer who didn't just, uh, you know, uh, use a grid and that's it. It's, it's more to it. But look at the car. I mean, this building was, you know, built maybe around 70 years ago. And, and yet it still has kind of a, you know, fresh modernity about it. These are well-known uh, old buildings of Parma. I, I, I love them. And here is uh, Franco Albini. And, and there are these details which are, uh, you know, uh, interesting and sophisticated. So, the, you know, the designer Franco Albini didn't allow the building to, you know, just be, you know, rational or rationalistic in a simplistic way. No. This is designed through and through. Look at the staircase. So this is in Parma. Now Uffici Ina, also I think in Parma, or or now is is this function Uffici Ina? Yes, it's the same building. Casa Corini, Parma, quite an elegant uh, building.
Now let's see some works by him, by Franco Albini as a designer. Veliero big bookcase. Uh, we already saw a drawing uh, of this, uh, I would say exceptional uh, piece of furniture. It's, it's, uh, its structure is also strikingly, you know, sculptural and the shelving system is very, very light. Here again, we see the, the power of the diagonal because the diagonal indeed uh, is a blessing for those who search for some dynamic quality, either in design or um, you know, in, in architecture. What is beautiful here is the, the very ingenious structural system. Essentially, the, the, the pleasure derives from uh, uh, an unusual, a structural system, which, because of its uniqueness, becomes ornamental. And the ornament is actually the one connected with pleasure, you know, because through its superfluousness, the ornament uh, proclaims the value of something else, not so much necessity but pleasure or freedom. We can use the word freedom. Everything is exquisite here. very fine work and look it uh, it can take a lot by the way uh, it can take a lot I, I, a lot i remember Wolf prick saying i can take a lot of praise <laughs> as if praise is weight is something heavy you know uh, a humorous way to put it i can take a lot of praise now these uh, shelving systems, uh, they, uh, they can take a lot of books on them and, uh, and, and you know, they, they don't fall apart. Remarkable. Who said that the shelving system has to be predictable and boring? It's not. You can see it here. And here is the, the author, the architect, behind his invention. Franco Albini. Now, as the staircase design we already saw, uh, one or two examples. Here is another one.
quite elegant and dramatic at the same time. Palazzo Rosso, Genova, the staircase that he's, uh, he's, he was a master of. <clears throat> Too bad this painting is here. I wish it was not here to to admire the staircase uh, undisturbed. No, these uh, staircases, they are quite egocentric, you know, they, they want all the atten attention, all the admiration to go to them. Uh, I'm joking, of course, but um, <laughs> it's kind of true. A staircase uh, wants, uh, wants all, all, the, all the, the adulation to come towards it. Would you call this the work of a neo-rationalist? I am not so sure about that. I mean, neo-rationalists probably don't feel a lot of attraction for the spiral, while he did. Now, some chairs, Luisa chairs, very elegant, very lightweight, probably, very comfortable, perhaps, exquisite de design. He received three times during his lifetime the, the most prestigious award for designers in Italy. And you can tell why. Gala chair, very different from the previous one. Almost burlesque, almost baroque. It almost has something uh, in common with certain parts, or it could have, it could be a part of something that uh, more abundantly is present in some sitting uh, 
pieces or chairs by Frank Gehry. And again, would you call this a piece designed by a neo-rationalist? I'm not sure at all about this. He was a complex designer and, and, and architect. And look, at the, look at the craft, the, everything is woven uh, perfectly. By the way, tomorrow I will talk about uh, Zen architecture because tomorrow it will be uh, an occasion to pay homage to an important Zen master and teacher. And I thought, by the way, a bit to talk about uh, Zen architecture. And uh, I thought a bit because, uh, you know, Zen is usually associated with minimalism and, uh, you know, rationalism or neo-rationalists also could be you know, connected with, uh, with minimalism. But what we see here is not really minimalism at all. That's why I said, I think Franco Albini is, is more complex than just uh, to label him a, a neo-rationalist. find peace. Well, it is said that uh, Franco Albini, he, uh, he worked often uh, in, uh, in, in harmony with, uh, you know, uh, craftsmen and traditional crafts in Italy, and you can see this here very well. You couldn't build this without uh, a significant, uh, you know, uh, collaboration with, uh, with uh, great craftsmen. A rocking chair, quite elegant. He was a great designer. I mean, look at this piece. You, you understand how it was built. You see the constructive uh, logic of the piece, and yet aesthetically is 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 very accomplished and and uh, you know pleasing. A children's rocking chair from 1950s. Fiorenza, <clears throat> Fiorenza armchair. You see his uh, repertoire is quite, uh, quite large. 
we saw various pieces of furniture which are very different from each other. The Pesci armchair. A table. This one also quite elegant. And I imagine lightweight and, uh, and also very stable. This one, the whimsical, you know, it's, it's a little table that you can carry, you know, with you within the room, you know, moving, moving it quickly uh, and comfortably for, from one place to another. I like it. It's, it's, it's interesting. Franco Albini. And it's actually a very useful piece because we all have the need, you know, for something, you know, you can bring closer to you, you can move to another place quickly. You don't need a lot of surface, but uh, it, it is a useful piece. And usually we don't think of, you know, of a table in these terms. I could almost call it the cane table because of this, uh, you know, uh, vertical element, which is quite useful. You just pick it up from there and move it wherever you want it to, to be with it. It's whimsical as well. And this is a chair. Can you imagine? I mean, you know, it's an idealized uh, view, but of a piece which is uh, functional. And uh, I, I chose to end this presentation on Franco Albini with it because it shows, you know, the, this, this meeting between necessity and freedom. And uh, you have a piece you can sit on, but at the same time seen from a certain point of view because of the exquisiteness of the design. 
you can get something that you don't even think it's actually a, a, a chair. Okay, and now if you want, because there are 172 years since uh, Chopin died, I'll show you some works that I received uh, for a competition I launched in 2010, so 11 years ago, uh, uh, for a house for uh, Chopin, for Frederic Chopin. Okay, uh, we received several projects. They are not all very good and uh, very interesting, but there are a few that are. Uh, so this was the great uh, composer and uh, pianist who died young, I think, uh, 30, 37 or so. And I will read uh, you now the text that I wrote. And I have to say that I launched these competitions now for almost 20 years and uh, without offering prizes, without uh, asking for a registration fee, and yet we received works from many countries. And I launched uh, almost 100 competitions in 20 years. This was one of them from 2010, as I said, and I will read you now the, the invitational text. So a house for Frédéric Chopin, International Architectural Competition 2010. Dizzy, yes, dizzy with, of melancholia, as regressive rapture Chopin makes us. It is difficult not to cry, destined for dissolution, long, longingly, when a polonaise is played. And all of this because of the maddening music that Chopin composed, maddening because too full of soul. Not that this was, is a bad thing, far from it, but so very uncommon. When the piano met him, the piano learned to lament and exult and cry and whisper and sing and dance in such a sublime, piercingly kind, if we can, so, if we can say so, forms, that he didn't regain its conscience ever since. It is our belief that after Chopin, the piano was simply not the same whatever other composers might say or might have said. We ask you to be romantic like never before, dear architect. It is true, it is not autumn now, the proper season for romanticism. Well, when I launched this competition, it was in the spring, in March. Yet the gray of the skies in some parts of the world, the cold weather and the expectancy of spring may make us believe and hope, yes, hope, that suffering understood as an enhancement of feelings and as a creative springboard is still possible, that romantic longing is still possible and that Chopin's piano music is as adequate for expressing unfashionable feelings as it always was. So we ask you to design a house for Frédéric Chopin now that we are approaching the day of his 200th birthday. Can we transform our building into a piano and or a piano into a building? Can we transform it into a nocturne or a polonaise or vice versa? If there ever was the chance to envision a flying building, this is it, fly, fly together with the house for a great musician. Design a house for someone who in the words of George Sand was more Polish than Poland itself. But at his most nationalistic, he became paradoxically universal. Yes, he was so intensely Polish that he became all of us. His soul was and is ours. So this is what I wrote, and now you'll see the works. As I said, they are not all very interesting, unfortunately. But Olivia Saragusi and Luca Quaranta, uh, a couple in love from France, a French woman and an Italian man. They send these, uh, you know, lyrical uh, drawings uh, uh, or renderings, you might say they are not a building. Well, they are through the, the atmosphere they, they evoke. Uh, and, uh, you know, 
uh, sometimes in, 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 in drawings or, or works, collages or whatever, paintings, and you can, uh, you can uh, approximate what you'd like to do as a building, even if the building didn't yet uh, uh, become, so to speak. So this was done by this, uh, these two people. Somehow the digital drawing is, uh, or uh, you know, rendering or image is more interesting than than the manual ones. Now Johannes uh, Johann Bergme from Germany, uh, now, <laughs> attempt to uh, to sketch a possible house for Chopin. The word house is uh, is to be taken in a generic form that is you know, it's not necessarily a house to live in, but a house to, or a building to symbolize somehow something connecting with the, with the, with the theme. In this case, the music of Frédéric Chopin. Then Malgozia Barlik and Jakub Gardolinski from Poland. They propose something more feasible, a pavilion, you know, to be placed in various parts of the city with a piano and, uh, you know, to, to be able to, you know, uh, create music, as I said, in, in, in various parts of the city. I don't know. I mean, I don't know how a pianist would feel inside that glass cage, but uh, anyway, that's what, that's what they proposed. Now, Galina Stojanova from Bulgaria, she made a building, uh, you know, which uh, evokes music. Uh, I don't know, if particularly for Chopin. Maybe it evokes music too explicitly. Maybe, maybe yes, maybe not. Anyway, the building is not very, very innovative, but it has some, some, some virtues in its attempt to connect with music. Now, Matthew Crowley and Sarah Rice from the United States, a more courageous work, Chateau Chopin. So I guess they were they were inspired by what they wrote there, the postmortem cast of Chopin's hand. And indeed, the hand is very important for a piano, piano player. Well, not only for a piano player, of course, but uh, you cannot play the piano uh, with uh, inadequate hands, so to speak. Anyway, so Chateau Chopin is derived from two fundamental sources. The intent was to capture a home that is as lively and tragic as Chopin's sound music, something that embodies life as no one but Chopin understood it. The first piece selected is Chopin Berceuse, Opus 57. Berceuse translates to the English world lullaby and is chosen to metaphorically represent the beginning of life. The second piece chosen is Chopin's Nocturne, Opus 9, number two, argu arguably his greatest nocturne. Uh, the nocturne metaphorically represents the end of life, the eternal sleep. Combined, the two represent the timeline of life which resides in Chateau Chopin. Initially, the two musical scores were study studied independently and data consisting of the repeating elements were extracted from his two pieces. Then using these notes as points in space, 
boundaries were created by copying in all directions, thus creating a third dimension. A Voronoi diagram, um, let's see, what is this? A Voronoi diagram was then created from the points as an homage to the methods in which music is transcribed, mathic mathematical divisions. After the diagram was created, a series of crescendo studies ensued. The diagram was built into a series of tube-like tube formations that undulated much as Chopin's music undulates with crescendo notations. Interestingly, during the course of the studies, an undeni undeniable likeness to Chopin post-mortem cast hands became evident in the drawings and also became a secondary point of study. This ultimately became the form for the structure. And these are the people who uh, who did the work. Uh, as you can see, you can approach architecture from a conceptual uh, starting point and, uh, you know, even a speculative starting point. Now, Ernest Strydon from South Africa, he did a, maybe he already had a, a building or a house designed and he named it the House for Chopin. I don't know, I don't want to be malicious, maybe this was not the case. Anyway, this is what he did. Essentially, you know, if you remove that undulating uh, or curved uh, roofing parts, you get a rather, you know, common building. But anyway, that's what he said. He said in 2010. Now, uh, you know, since 2010 to 2021, some time passed, and today with the um, higher technologies, in more interesting works could be could be could be imagined and could, could be built. Now this is a work which I don't quite understand. It only has one uh, one drawing, and it's rather. I don't know. If music be the food of love, play on. Give me excess of it, that's self fighting. The opposite may sicken and so and so die. I don't know who, who wrote this anyway. Um, I don't know what this has to do with, uh, with Chopin's music, so I, I, I move on. Mikhail Primshev from Russia. This is an interesting thing, actually. A swing tree house dedicated to Frédéric Chopin in our minds, house is usually a shelter. We suppose that it should save us from open world, bad weather, unpleasant people. Every time creating a new idea of a house, architects used to think about the walls, windows and doors, floors and roofs. We can imagine it in box or blob or grid configuration because we easily think about the former space firstly. Music is a temporal art, architecture is spatial. Music is live material. It doesn't need any spatial frames to appear. We feel it without my, with, with our mind. Architecture used it to be a spatial and interactive sculpture. We contact it with through our body to make feelings. This creative concept, concept of house is not a shelter. It is just a trial to make some process of interaction. Swing tree house can be a place for musical meetings or performing and be a place of different cultural and age integration. Swings try to make people free from gravity and give a feeling of flying. It can be converted to different systems of interaction and used seasonally in various ways. So yeah, that's, that's the so-called house for Frédéric Chopin. Uh, and it's an interesting idea in a way. And, you know, all these uh, swings, you know, uh, if used would, uh, would offer musicality to, to the whole structure somehow. And also they connect in a way with the trees nearby, as, as the sketch suggests. So, you know, the word house could be understood in a very large way. In, in various ways. Oh, 
Okay, now uh, these people from England. Again, music is about freedom, although that freedom is arrived at through rigor, through mathematical rigor, but it doesn't remain at, at the level of just rigor. It has to, it has to proclaim loud and clear freedom. It was the unforgettable picture to see Chopin sitting at the piano like a clairvoyant lost in his dreams, to see how his vision communicated itself through his playing, and how at the end of each piece, he had a sad habit of running one finger over the length of the plaintive keyboard as though to tear himself away from his dream. Robert Schumann, this is what Schumann uh, wrote. So, Chopin plus music equals sound constructed. Uh, by the way of uh, equations, tomorrow I will talk about zero equals abundance, by the way of Zen architecture. Okay, Shakira Hamas from Egypt. This is an anxious sketch that she did and then follows the uh, 3D Max uh, rendering of it. I want to say again that these people did these works without expecting any prize. It's also true without paying any registration fee. They just did these works because they wanted to pay homage to Chopin and maybe because also they were inspired by the invitational text. So I do think it's possible to do works like this without having in mind earning anything besides the pleasure of doing a creative work. Now, Witold Kiedinski, from uh, Germany, Poland. He was residing in Germany at that time, but he was uh, Polish, uh, is Polish. I don't know very well what this building has to do with, uh, with the Chopin. I mean, I see here as kind of a little intimate, you know, uh, musical room with a piano and some chairs. Anyway, and it seems to be placed in the desert um, by the way of desert tomorrow, I will also talk about an architect who was born on the, on, on the 18th of October, uh, Frey, an, a, a Swiss architect who worked with Le Corbusier and he built buildings, uh, you know, within the, what was called, um, desert modernism in the United States. Well, of course, these works are dreams, but I think they have also a value that would be formative, that you do these works, even if they don't necessarily uh, become uh, built works, but uh, they, they uh, could anticipate future works that, that could become uh, built, built works.
Okay, and now uh, uh, conceptual work rather minimalist from uh, Vuk uh, Babo, Babovic from Serbia, Rubato. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's approximating, uh, you know, a, a musical segment through these, uh, you know, cubes that you, you move from one to the other and they are placed in the vicinity of a lake and, uh, you know, it's, it's just a sketch. But music, if it is good, invites to contemplation. And, uh, you know, without music, probably life would be uh, totally unbearable. Now, and I end this, uh, you know, short presentation with this work from China, from Yi Xiaowo, uh, China uh, is the most poetical of all. Uh, you see the moon there, you see something that might become, could become a building, but, uh, you know, uh, you need a little bit of imagination for that, but it's possible. But it's uh, in this uh, visual representation, I think you see that longing for, for, uh, for the infinite. And uh, Chopin's music, I think, uh, does the same thing. How she plays that piano there above the building is, uh, you know, uh, poetically interesting, but maybe feasibly uh, less so. I mean, it is possible, of course, but. Uh, uh, very unusual. Uh, it's from China is the dreamiest of all works that we saw. And here are the sketches, the manual drawings that she did prior to modeling what she did, um, you know, digitally. That's it. So 172 years ago, Chopin died. <laughs>